Do you ever wonder how people get rid of their sins? All of us sin, every one of us without exception. I don't even have to convince you of that. You maybe even sinned sometime today, uh, maybe even before you crawled out of a bed, but every one of us has sinned, right? And do you ever wonder how people try to, to gain a clear conscience? How do they go about that? Of course, there are many, many people who take a spiritual approach. And they will uh, seek to have their sins absolved through confession. And so what they will do is they will take time out of their week, out of their daily schedule, and uh, they will meet up with a priest in a confessional, and uh, they will confess their sins uh, to the holy man, right? So that's one approach, the, the spiritual approach. And of course, there are many other individuals who we could say take a psychological or a mental approach. What do I mean by that? Well, what they'll do is they'll try to, to purge themselves of feeling bad about something that they did in the past, and uh, they will uh, go through a time of, of therapy. and. So they will make sure they have in their schedule a, a time where they can uh, sit down and just uh, put it all out there. They will express uh, their disappointment or how things went down uh, with how they maybe even failed God. And they will pour out their hearts to a counselor, maybe some psychiatrist, a psychologist. And so there is this psychological or, or mental approach that many people will take. You know as well as I do that many people will also uh, put into practice a, a physical approach when there's something that is stressing them out. And so they will give themselves over to rigorous physical activity uh, that can help them to cope from the stress that they have as a result of something that they did or did not do, something they said or did not say, something they thought or maybe did not think that they should have. And, and so they, they want to release the stress physically. And they may do that by getting involved with aerobics or weightlifting or perhaps uh, through spending time with some sports activity. And then, of course, there are people who we could say could embrace an avoidance approach. An avoidance approach. They will alter their state of being in order to cope with some sin or sins in their lives. How do they do that? Well, you know as well as I do, it's not something that we have to think long and hard about. Maybe they'll give themselves over to drugs or alcohol. And of course, we live in a day and age where there are so many different forms of, of entertainment. And you don't need to look far to discover how you can have fun, you could play, you could lose yourself in all sorts of um, forms of, of avoidance behavior. There are other people who say, you know, I, I'm not into the, the spiritual thing at all. And, and, and in fact, I, I don't even believe that there's a God. And, and, and uh, there, you'll have other people who say, I'm not into um, the psychological or, or mental approach. I, I, I'm surely not into uh, some physical expression uh, when it comes to dealing with my sin. And I'm not into avoidance behavior. When I, I feel bad about how I have sinned in some area in my life, uh, what I'm about is a substitutional approach. And I will swap out how bad I feel about myself because of my sin, and I will do some things that make me feel better. What does that look like? It may involve giving money to someone who has a need, or perhaps losing yourself in good works or some humanitarian or philanthropic activity. So there are a wide variety of different ways in which uh, people deal with sin and try to get rid of it and not have to feel the pain and the shame that, that comes along uh, with 
maybe some sin that they recently committed. Now, when we go back in history, it's fascinating to discover the rigmarole that many people would give themselves over to in order to be able to be restored into fellowship after they have sinned in some area in their lives. During the early part of the second century, the church was not exactly jumping up and down. It was not excited about extending forgiveness uh, to a person who maybe uh, blew it in some area in their life, especially some gross sin like, like adultery or murder or apostasy. And before a person could be restored back into the, the fellowship with God, they were required to wade through the, the murky waters of a three- to four-year procedure. Incredible. You probably haven't heard of this procedure before, but it definitely was in vogue back in the day. A person who, during the second century, wanted to get right with God and make sure that uh, everything was kosher between them and their fellowship group, uh, had to first take on the role of, of a weeper. A weeper. Historically, we know that this is the case. Those who were in the, the weeper category literally would be involved in, in begging to be forgiven. And so they went around weeping and, and, and uh, just pleading with the church, please restore me back into fellowship. Now this particular phase could last anywhere from a few months to literally uh, a few years. Now, if you were able to stay the course and you wanted to see to it that you were forgiven, then you would be able to advance to the next level. And that would be a level that was set aside for hearers. Hearers. A hearer who reached this stage was an individual who would be allowed to listen to the scripture reading and the preaching of the word of God on that given day. But check this out. If you were here, you, you couldn't sit where you're sitting right now. You were required to be in the corner of the church. You were sequestered as a hearer. It reminds me when I was a, a kid, I, it, you would, you'd be sent off to the corner. I, I think even be, before elementary school days for me, they even made uh, kids wear a dunce cap. And the spotlight was on them. I mean, they were humiliated because of some experience that they gave themselves to. And so if you were here, uh, you were required to remain in the corner of a church, and you could only listen to the scripture reading and the sermon. And just like in the previous group, you were not permitted to participate with the Lord's table. That was off limits for you. Now, if you really stayed the course, if you had stick to itiveness and, and you wanted to just plow through this process, you wanted to be restored back in the fellowship, you wanted to be forgiven for your sins, then you advance to the next stage, which would be for a group of people known as kneelers. And a person who was a kneeler, again, think back to the second century AD, very different day and age, the kneelers were permitted to kneel before praying publicly. They were graced in that way. You say, how many stages are there? There's one more. Maybe you wanted to be forgiven so much for your sin and you went through the phase of being uh, a, a weeper, then a hearer, then a kneeler. The last fourth stage would be for people called standers. Standers. If you were a standard, you were permitted to participate in the worship service, but you had to be standing the entire time. 
You were never allowed to sit at any point in time. And once again, you were not allowed to participate with the Lord's table. Now, if you survived this long, arduous process, you then could be restored back into the fellowship as long as you confessed your sins to the entire church family and you were absolved of your sins by the minister. And then you would be greeted with the holy kiss by the congregation. Then you could be restored back into the fellowship. You could be perceived as forgiven. But you would never be allowed to serve in the capacity as a clergyman. Well, at that point, who would want to, right? That'd be very awkward. Of course, we know historically, later on, the Roman Catholic Church developed the whole practice of selling indulgences. And it was a commonly understood practice back then. Uh, People pretty much universally believed uh, that a, a person... If that individual wanted to have his or her punishment in purgatory shortened, then that individual had to pay indulgences. And even then, they would only be partially forgiven. And so if you wanted to be forgiven in the Roman Catholic Church during the Middle Ages, what you would be required to do is purchase indulgences from a local minister. Now, when we come to the Word of God, it is abundantly clear that you and I cannot get rid of our sins, the pain and the shame and the guilt linked with them through a priest or through therapy, through good works, sacrificial giving, humanitarian efforts, and certainly not through exercise. You say, okay, then, so what is an appropriate way, what is an appropriate course of action that I need to take personally in order to, to deal appropriately with my sins? What is a great way that I can correctly deal with a sin in my life right now that weighs heavy upon my heart? Well, there are some great lessons that we discover and have been discovering from Psalm 51, right? And in Psalm 51, we are going to discover yet another one. Again, the man after God's own heart, we can learn a lot of lessons from him, King David. David had a beautiful, delicious relationship uh, with his God. He was tight. He was intimate with uh, the Lord. And we can learn a lot about how to even confess our sins, how to get into that whole process biblically by watching his model for us. And so if you have your Bible handy, I invite you to turn there, if you will, to Psalm 51, verse 9. Psalm 51, verse 9. Notice it with me, if you will. There, David, in his prayer of confession, says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. One paraphrase of the Bible puts it like this. Don't keep looking at my sins. Erase them from your sight. If I were to bottom line the message today for you and make it as succinct and clear as possible, I would package it like this. Only God can cancel out your sins, and my sins. God is the only one who ultimately is in the business of ridding us of the stain and the guilt of our sins. Now, maybe you're wondering to yourself, why is David making such a fuss? 
Why is he making such a, a big deal about his sin before God? I mean, we all sin. We sin probably on a daily basis. And just maybe we're thinking to ourselves, man, just chill out. Why are you so uptight, David? Well, David knew that God does not overlook sin. As a society, as a culture, we are becoming numb to sin all around us. We're not only being told to tolerate sins of all sorts, and there are all sorts of examples that we can all think of right now, but we're told to embrace and approve of sin. That's all around us, right? But God does not overlook sin. He does not wink at it and say, yeah, that's okay. Um, you're only human after all. Listen to Jeremiah 16, verse 17. There we are told that God communicates this understanding of himself. My eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face. Nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. In other words, God is saying, I am watching you very closely. I have my eye on you. And you can run, but you cannot hide. Your life is like an open book. I see everything there is to see about you. I know everything there is to, to know about you. I observe you. I know your thoughts. I know the things that you've said or should have said, the things you did or did not do. And so David is aware of the fact that it is this type of God to whom he is accountable. And so David is telling God that he, he wants God to bury the hatchet once and for all when it comes to his sin. Let's uh, dig a little deeper for a few moments and have a little grammar lesson here. In the original language, David shifts from using the optative mood uh, which expresses a hope or a wish. And he segues to using what is known as the imperative mood. And this is expressing a command. David is not asking God to blot out his sins, to erase them. He, he, he's not asking God, he's not hoping that God will do that. He's actually telling God, do this. He is almost ordering God to do something. He wants this so desperately that he's not just putting this out as a suggestion. He's, he's saying, God, you, you've got to do this. He's intense about it. By the way, to grasp the phrase, hide thy face or hide your face, let's do a little digging. Part of understanding the scriptures when we are studying the Bible, it's very helpful to allow God to be his own commentator on his own book, the Bible, of course. And so scripture interprets scripture is a principle of biblical interpretation, also known as hermeneutics. And so we look elsewhere in the word of God for how a word or a phrase is used. I was looking through the blue letter edition of the Bible online. Uh, I was looking through different apps uh, that maybe I could use. I was at the men's breakfast at Mosner's and the reception was horrible and I couldn't get the Bible on my phone offline. So I thought, okay, well, I, I need to find a different Bible app that will help me with that. That kind of rhymes, didn't it? Okay. Uh, so I found this blue letter edition, and uh, you can could, you could trace a word throughout the Bible. You can trace a phrase. And this helps us understand how a word or a phrase is used elsewhere. And it's especially important when you're considering what the human author how that individual used a word or a phrase. In any case, the word hide is the exact same word that is used with reference to David when he hid himself from Saul. Uh, 1 Samuel 20, verses 5 and following. It's also used with reference to Elijah when he hid himself at the book Cherith. 
1 Kings 17, verse 3. Uh, the phrase, hide your face, is also used with reference to men who hide their face from Mashiach, from the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ, according to Isaiah 53, verse 3. And it's also used in connection to the prudent man who sees evil and hides himself. Proverbs 22, verse 3, Proverbs 27, verse 12. How is David using the word hide in this verse? What, how does he uniquely get across the meaning of this word? Well, from the original, we understand that the word here that is used it takes on the meaning of to veil. To veil. Shortly after Zanita and I were married back in 1985, uh, we were married in January, and later on in the year, we had the opportunity to go to Israel. And while we were in Israel, we saw the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, in Hebrew, Yerushalayim. And this is a very important place. At that particular location, we know that uh, Abraham sought to offer up his son Isaac per God's command. We also know that um, the Jewish uh, writings of the, the Bible tell us that that's where Jacob saw the ladder that, that led to heaven. And it's also the place where the innermost chamber of the Jewish temple resides to this day. This is a sacred location to Jewish people. We tend to think of this as just being a, a, a Muslim religious site. No, but to Jewish people, this is a very, very important biblical site. And then, of course, as we think about Muslims and how they perceive the Dome of the Rock, uh, they see this as very special too, like uh, uh, Mecca and other holy places that they have around the world. They believe that this is the specific location uh, where Mohammed passed through the heavens to God. So the point being is that this location, this dome of the rock, is significant. It is a special spiritual location. It is in the vicinity where the third temple will be rebuilt. There are, I understand, approximately five red heifers that are being raised up, and one or more of them may be used in the third temple during the tribulation when the Antichrist is here. And so this is a very, very important location on the planet. Not only are women not allowed to wear shorts anywhere near the Dome of the Rock, and they are not allowed to wear anything that can be even perceived as immodest. But the women are required to, to wear a full face covering known as a burqa. A burqa is a double layered piece of cloth which covers the entire face of a woman with the exception of two holes. So she can look out of this burqa, this head covering. Now, in Psalm 51, David is telling God, he's not asking in a nice way, he's not suggesting, he's not hoping, he's telling God that he wants God to hide himself at a level that is even more restrictive than a burqa. You see, with a burqa, you at least have two holes that you could look through. And David is saying, I don't even want that. I want something that is so restrictive that you can't see my sins. You can't observe them. David wants God's eyes to be completely veiled so that God cannot look upon his sins. What a prayer. What a profound utterance of King David who wanted to appropriately deal with his sins 
once and for all. He didn't so much want God to be able to take a little peek at his sins or look through holes through a cloth. Hide your face from my sins. Make it so that there is a burka type of experience you have, God, without the holes. That's what I am telling you to do, God. I'm not asking, I'm telling you, do this. Well, in addition to telling God to hide his face from his sins, David also tells God to blot out all of his iniquities. The idea behind the phrase blot out is wipe out. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of, of something that is being wiped out, I, I can picture right now my, my car is dirty. It's filthy. I haven't washed it in a while. Maybe it's going to rain. I don't have to worry about it. But right now my, my car is, is pretty, it, it, it's pretty disgusting. It, it's got all sorts of dirt and spots on it. And uh, I'm not into waxing. Just, just to have a, a, a clean machine would be nice. And, and so... When there is like a smudge mark on our cars, uh, we could take a hose to it, we can take a cloth and, and try to rub out uh, the dirt that we happen to see there. Or maybe when you're picturing wiping out uh, something, what's going through your mind is you just got through eating a wonderful lasagna dinner. That sounds pretty good about right now, doesn't it? And you notice that there are these food grimy stains and some food particles and so you wipe out how that plate is nasty it's not just nasty it's nasty it's beyond nasty and so you wipe out you wash out all of the grime all of the dirt all the smut from that well david wants God to do way more than just wipe out his sins as we think of it, just washing it away or dealing with it in some way, shape, or form. The expression blot out is used in connection to how God wiped out everyone on the face of the earth except for Noah and his family, according to Genesis. The expression blot out is also used in connection to how God utterly removed the memory of Amalek, Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. By the way, if you're curious in terms of how it's used in connection to the flood, uh, you could look up Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, Genesis 7, verse 4. We also know that Moses uh, requested to be blotted out of God's book. That was pretty severe. He just wanted to be extinguished from the book of God, Exodus 32, verse 32. And the expression blot out, it's also used in connection to the tribe of Benjamin that could be extinguished, Judges 21, verse 17. So think of it like this. The idea of blot out deals with destroying, deals with annihilating, it deals with extinguishing something from its existence so it is no more. That's what David is after. He doesn't want God just to apply some suds to his soul. He wants the sins which David committed to be destroyed, to be utterly annihilated in the mind of God. Let's further honor our understanding of this by turning from Psalm 51 uh, to Colossians chapter 2. If you will join me there, uh, we'll just take a, a brief look at this very important passage, Colossians chapter 2. I want you to see that if you're a Christian, if you know and love the Lord Jesus, then every single one of your sins have been utterly destroyed, utterly annihilated, and utterly extinguished. It is as though they don't even exist in the heart and mind of God. Look at verse 13. 
there we are told, and he's talking to believers here, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature. Stop right there. In Old Testament times, to not be physically circumcised was identified with, with people who were considered alienated from God and outside of a covenant relationship with God. These were perceived as being unbelievers. Paul then says, when you were spiritually dead and cut off from God, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code. That's interesting. The written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed uh, to us. A common thought even within Judaism is that God keeps records. He keeps a, a ledger of our sins, of the times that we have failed him. Well, not only, according to this passage, is the debt removed, but according to this text, God destroyed the document. There's nothing being held against you. It's been nuked. It's been annihilated. How did God do that? How did he go about annihilating or utterly destroying the document which could have our sins recorded on it? How did he go through that process? Well, the answer is found in this passage where it talks about the certificate of sin. The rest of verse 14 says, He, that is God, took it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, I'm sure that King David did not understand the full ramifications, the full implications of, of, of how the Messiah was, was going to die on the cross for his sins. He didn't see the whole picture. Uh, even all of uh, prophetic scripture had not even been recorded. So David's understanding was, was quite limited. There was not progressive revelation as we have a full canon of scripture available to us today. But he had some level of appreciation. The point I want to make here is sometimes we act like we're not forgiven when we are. Sometimes we, we read a verse like this and we say, yeah, yeah, I, I get it, but I, I, I still feel really puny inside. I, I, I feel like I still owe God. I, 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 I feel like my life is, is a mess and I don't know how God could possibly forgive me once again in this same area. Let me illustrate it for you like this. There was a little boy who was given his first slingshot. Have any of you had a slingshot before? Uh, most of you. Hopefully you're careful if you're still using your slingshot. In any case, this little kid, he, he had his uh, slingshot and, and he, he spent a good amount of time practicing with his slingshot to, to, to try to aim his various uh, targets. And no matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't hit anything uh, with the stone that he had placed in the slingshot. He was always missing. Well, one day he goes uh, to his grandma's backyard. He finds a stone. He picks it up from the ground. He carefully puts it into his slingshot. Oh, there's grandma's pet duck right over there. Hmm. I wonder if I can hit the duck. And so he aims he pulls back, lets it fly, and he nails the duck right in the head, kills it, and the duck kills over. And he's feeling really guilty about this whole thing. I mean, he's just, he's a hot mess. And so he, he takes this dead duck that was his grandma's pet, and he buries it under a woodpile. At the same time, he happens to notice that his sister, Sally, is watching the whole thing. And in his mind, he's thinking, uh-oh. I can't just pretend like the duck died on its own. 
And so a little bit later on in that day, Grandma says to Sally, hey Sally, uh, why don't you help me to, uh, to wash these dishes? Sally says, oh, um, Grandma, uh, Johnny um, told me that he's going to help out with cleaning the kitchen today. Isn't that right, Johnny? And he whispers, she whispers to her brother, remember the duck. Day after day after day, little Johnny is not only carrying out his chores, he's also doing the chores of his sister. And, and, and this is getting old after a while. He, he's just saying, I, I don't like doing this. I mean, I hate my own chores. And, and now it's like double duty. All because my sister saw me kill grandma's pet duck. Well, he gets to a breaking point and he, he feels like he just can't handle it any longer. And so he's just, he's so despondent, he's so sad, he, he sheepishly goes up to his grandma, <sighs> lets out a sigh, and he confesses to her. He says, Grandma, I hate to tell you this. I can't even get the words out. With that new slingshot that I have, I, I, I killed your pet duck. I'm so sorry. He's crying. He's just losing himself. He is just wiped out. Grandma puts her arms around him, gives him a big hug. And she says, I know, Johnny. I was watching through the window when you killed my duck. And Sally also noticed. We both saw the whole thing go down. And Johnny, because I love you, I forgave you. I was just wondering, though, Johnny, how long you were going to allow your sister to make a slave out of you. My sense is that there may be some Johnnies in our midst today. Individuals who have allowed another person to make a slave out of you. A person who is holding something over you and they've got you. You're their prisoner. You've become their slave. Maybe you're not running errands or doing chores like Johnny was doing for Sally, his sister. But that person has got you. You are chained to that person. You're at that individual's mercy. And it's uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. It's so easy for us to succumb to the demands and expectations of other people and to allow them to sort of guide us around as though there is some kind of hook in our nose, even though no such hook exists. And we allow that individual to manipulate us, to lead us around, to act as if they have something over us. This could be your sibling. You may have a brother or sister who is your Sally in your life, holding something against you, enslaving you. It could be your mate. Maybe there was something that you did during the course of your marriage that you're ashamed of, and your mate will be the first to remind you of that. It could be a friend. It could be an individual in the church. It could be someone in our community. Maybe someone you don't even have a close relationship with. But that person is holding something against you, and you are that person's slave. Not because you are, but because you have willingly allowed that chain to connect 
between you and that individual. Well, if you are here as a true Christian, not a phony Christian, not just a professing Christian, but if you are a true, bona fide follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then all of your sins are forgiven. There is no chain. You have true freedom. You're free. There is no bondage between you and your sins that another person is allowed to hold over you because Jesus is a higher authority than that individual, that man or that woman. And so if you trust in Jesus and what he did at Calvary's cross, he has canceled out all of your sins. The ones that are so embarrassing to you that if they were put on our PowerPoint presentation, or better yet, in some stadium, to be seen on a jumbotron, they would just embarrass the daylights out of you. Then again, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, he's not your savior at this moment, he's not your Lord, he's not your leader, then your sins have not been blotted out. They, they still are affixed to you, whether you realize it or not, you are a slave. You're a prisoner. However, you are not a prisoner to someone like Sally. Oh no. You're a prisoner to an individual who has much, much more power that he wields, and that's Satan himself. You're chained to him if you don't know the Lord. Now, you may not be possessed by the devil, like I assume uh, Emily was from the exorcism of Emily Rose. Never saw the movie, but I assume this Emily woman was possessed. Uh, you may not be possessed by Satan himself, but according to the word of God, uh, we are told in 2 Timothy 2, 26, you are being held captive by Satan to do his will. You're being held in his clutches, uh, whether you are cognizant of it or not, whether you are aware of the fact that you are carrying out his will or not. You and I both know that uh, more mandates are going to be rolled out. We know that mask wearing is going to be imposed on uh, people throughout our country. Uh, uh, they're going to want us to get the wah-wah um, the, the poke, uh, the jab, and everyone will have a decision that they will need to make about that. But regardless of who you are today, there is no vaccination against the devil if you don't know the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, there's no quick fix. You just need freedom you need those chains to be broken once and for all from the enemy. And the only way that happens is by entering into a personal relationship with Jesus. Not getting religious, not getting all churchy, but you're in a personal, intimate relationship with the risen Savior. Hear the words of Jesus himself. If, therefore, the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And that is the status. That's the position. That's the condition of every Christian. A person who is free from the bondage of sin. In just a few moments, uh, we are going to be preparing for the Lord's table. We've said a lot during our time together. At the very minimum, as believers, we ought to have incredible gratitude for what the Lord has done for us. He has hidden his face from our sins, from your sins, my sins. He has blotted out, he's destroyed, he's nuked all of our iniquities. I wonder if we can take just a few moments right now to bow our heads coming quietly before the Lord. 
while we do that, let me just run by you a, a question or two, maybe something you, you haven't thought about, you're trying to think, how do I process this? How do I apply this uh, to my life? Very simply, are you grateful? Are you sincerely full of, of thankfulness that God has chosen to hide his face from your sins? Are you appreciative of the fact that he has blotted out every sin that you have committed past, present, and future? Or would you have to say, in all honesty, you're rather blasé about the whole matter? Ah, we're here once again in church, and uh, we're going to be going through communion. Uh, I guess I have to listen to this guy with the loud jacket once again. Are you blasé about what Jesus has done for you? This is the greatest news in the universe, that God took on human flesh and died on that unbelievably wretched cross that you and I deserved. He did that for us. And because of that, our sins, the certificate of them, have been annihilated, destroyed, completely extinguished.